So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webinar, STBBI Stigma, A Barrier to Care. For your information, all participants' microphones are muted today. If you have any questions you would like to be addressed after the presentation, please use the Q&A box that's located in the bottom center of your screen. The chat box is also available if you have any comments or technical questions or feedback along the way. My name is Savannah Holt. I'm the Sexual and Reproductive Health Program Coordinator with the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. The Prevention Institute is a provincial nonprofit organization that's located in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Our organizational focus is to reduce disabling conditions in children using primary prevention methods. We raise awareness by providing training, information, and resources based on current best evidence. We believe that all children, regardless of ability, have the right to the best physical, social, and emotional health possible. We work in a variety of areas, including sexual and reproductive health, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder prevention, maternal and infant health, early childhood mental health, child injury prevention, child traffic safety, and parenting. One focus of the sexual and reproductive health program is to provide evidence-based information on sexual and reproductive health that is accessible to healthcare practitioners and allied health professionals. Saskatchewan has high rates of sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. One of the greatest barriers for public engagement with the health system and activities like routine testing, treatment, and disclosure is stigma. Stigma for STIs, riskier behaviors, identities, and more can layer and contribute to rising rates of negative sexual health outcomes. It's imperative that care providers understand it, recognize when they might be contributing to it, and learn how to reduce stigma and bias in their own practice in order to better support their clients. It is now my sincere pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Erin Beckwell is a social worker who has spent her career working in the areas of health, education, and community development. In her current role as Knowledge Translation Specialist with the Sask Saskatchewan Health Authority, Erin's work focuses on mobilizing knowledge to support the health system to achieve health equity and provide culturally safe care for all. Originally from Treaty 4 Territory in Southwest Saskatchewan, she is called Treaty 6 Territory and Homeland of the Métis, Saskatoon, Sask Saskatchewan, home for over 20 years. And now for Erin's presentation. Thank you for joining us, Erin. Thank you, Savannah. Um, I am just going to share my screen. And uh, there we go. You should be seeing my slide deck now. And uh, so, yeah, um, our conversation or presentation today uh, is going to uh, explore stigma. It's, of course, in an hour, we're going to have a a pretty quick overview and introduction to some ideas, hopefully some practical um, tips that you can use right away. Uh, but really I'm seeing this as an opportunity to lay the groundwork uh, for hopefully deeper thought, reflection and learning about uh, stigma regarding STBBIs. Uh, but we will have time for questions and conversation. Um, and so Savannah did a land acknowledgement. I also do want to just acknowledge uh, that I'm coming to you from Saskatoon, uh, Treaty 6 Territory and Homeland of the Métis. And I think when we're talking about a topic like stigma, it's really important to uh, contextualize that within um, the colonial context um, of the place and space and time we're in and uh, all of the, the, the cumulative impact of harms that uh, certainly result in a unique experience um, for Indigenous people and, and compounds the impact of stigma, um, I would say, in, in so many ways. And so uh, I think it's important for, as we, for us all to be thinking about that and keeping that in mind as we uh, sort of explore this topic this morning. So really quickly, just to make sure, I mean, throwing around a whole bunch of acronyms, I always like to start uh, by making sure uh, folks are all okay with what the language means. So STBBI is sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. Uh, and so we're talking about infection spread person to person through sexual contact or blood to blood contact. Um, some STBBIs are curable, others are treatable. Uh, and so we're talking about everything from 
chlamydia, gonorrhea, to HIV, hepatitis, uh, and everything in between uh, when we're discussing this topic. And so um, it, there's certainly lots available online to further understand the, the provincial context around STBVIs. I mean, we have uh, I would say a significant challenge on our hands and that has not improved uh, with uh, the pandemic that's happening right now. Uh, and in fact, there's quite a dire situation in some parts of the province uh, when it comes to STBBIs. And uh, some of that is around access to testing, uh, which of course has been impacted by the pandemic, but stigma plus pandemic equals even more significant challenges um, for folks. So. When we talk about stigma, really what we're talking about is a social process. Um, and so stigma can be um, experienced or anticipated. So I, uh, when we talk about anticipated stigma or anticipatory stigma is the sense that I am worried when I go to access care somewhere that I will be treated poorly or viewed differently or judged. Um, because of who I am or who I'm perceived to be. That's anticipated stigma. So then that person may choose not to access care um, partly or solely because of that anticipatory stigma. Um, it can also uh, appear in a variety of other ways, uh, but typically it's characterized by exclusion, rejection, uh, devaluation, those sorts of things that results from experience, perception, or reasonable anticipation of an adverse social judgment. So a negative judgment about a person or a group. Uh, and so that's a pretty academic -y sounding uh, definition. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, so it's experienced or anticipated. It can be something that um, has happened to people or it can be um, something people have heard has happened or that they worry uh, will happen. Often folks who have that anticipatory uh, sort of fear about uh, poor treatment or judgment, uh, there's a, a root in um, people they know who've had poor experiences. Uh, and in some cases, particularly Indigenous folks, there's often a, a very widespread uh, experience of poor care or poor access to care. Um, and that stigma then uh, sort of continues through that anticipatory uh, type of um, worry about how people will be cared for or not in, in, uh, in the health system or in other places. Uh, and so then we have, you know, exclusion. So people we don't think about or the sense that I've never encountered anyone like you. I've never had to think about this before. Um, or our services aren't for people like you or people in a particular group. Uh, rejection, uh, we can't serve you. We don't have the equipment necessary. We've never encountered this before. Uh, blame, well, what did you think was gonna happen when you do things like this? It's gonna increase your risk. Uh, avoidance, it might be, oh, uh, let's talk about something uh, that's, that's more pleasant. Uh, that would be an example of stigma communicated through avoidance or, or outright discrimination, um, which uh, is probably less common than other forms, uh, partly because people know they're not supposed to discriminate. Uh, so they maybe aren't overtly discriminating, but still actually um, impacting people's access to and experiences of care. And so it's that negative judgment about a person or group. Um, and, it, and so a group who is or is assumed to be living with impacted by or otherwise associated with a particular health condition. And in this case, we're talking about assumptions and negative judgments about who is impacted by uh, STBBIs, who is most likely to need support around those uh, types of experiences, uh, decision making around that and care related to that. And, um, and often it's who we think needs to be uh, part of discussions about this and who we think isn't affected by it. Um, and so here's an illustration uh, that uh, you might come across in other uh, settings where you're talking about stigma, but ultimately stigma is a very complex and nuanced experience for people. So we can have internalized stigma where um, our own sense of Maybe we blame ourselves. Well, it's my own fault that this happened to me. Uh, that would be an example of internalized stigma. You know, what did I expect to happen? Of course, I got this 
a particular sexually transmitted infection um, because I did things uh, that made me maybe feel like I deserved that or that that was a very likely consequence. There's also perceived stigma, um, enacted stigma where we are actually doing something, structural stigma, which is how services are delivered, designed, and uh, sometimes funded, evaluated, and so on. And then we have layered stigma as well, uh, which around the outside of this illustration, you'll see intersecting stigma where many of the folks we're supporting aren't just experiencing stigma on the basis of um, their perceived or actual connection to STBBIs. Uh, they're also experiencing things like homophobia and transphobia, ableism, classism, sexism, racism, and so on. Uh, and so then we also see that we can then confront stigma at a variety of levels at our individual level, in our own practice, in our own movement through the world, in interpersonal uh, connections with colleagues, uh, those sorts of things in our communities, our institutions, and um, ultimately in policy and, and legal or legislative uh, settings as well. So with all that said, uh, what does stigma look and feel like? Uh, and, I, and I think it's useful for all of us to reflect on whether we have experienced stigma in some part of our life, maybe around STBBIs, maybe around other things. And certainly one of the things I experienced early in my career, I worked uh, at AIDS Saskatoon, which is now known as Prairie Harm Reduction. Uh, I worked there for the first uh, almost 10 years of my career, and it really formed my um, understanding of so many things in my practice, um, including stigma. And so working in HIV AIDS work in the sort of mid to late 90s and early 2000s, um, I'd love to say it was such a different time than now. I think in some ways it was very different and in other ways there's still a lot of similarities to what we see now around stigma in particular. Uh, it's maybe shifted a bit, uh, but we still see stigma being a significant piece that impacts people's comfort in disclosing or telling people um, that they have or have had an STBBI, even that they've been tested uh, or that they would like to take action uh, to protect against these things. All of those disclosures are often influenced by people's sense of trust, safety, and stigma. Um, and certainly one of the things that uh, we experienced even as workers to some extent was that by being uh, affiliated with an agency that worked with people uh, who had HIV, Hep C, but who also um, might have been at risk for those things or uh, vulnerable to those things, uh, often for structural reasons, was that sometimes even within professional circles, workers were treated differently because of where we worked. Uh, so sometimes that stigma even extended to people who worked in that sector uh, and, and we experienced, you know, different treatment um, by colleagues who uh, didn't, who didn't work in, uh, you know, this STBBI sector and were often um, viewed as, you know, oh, well, you don't understand what it's like in like kind of mainstream services because you're off in this little niche, which is where we would like to keep you contained in this specialist uh, kind of setting. And that is in part, I think, one of the reasons why um, we certainly see agencies and services or clinics, uh, there are some that are seen as almost specializing in uh, treating uh, or testing uh, STBBIs. And then we see some that are kind of like, yeah, not my department. And the reality is um, work around STBBI screening, testing, treatment, uh, for the most part can be done in almost any primary health setting. And uh, this idea that it's somehow specialized and something that not every physician or nurse practitioner or um, healthcare provider, social worker for that matter, can respond to is really evidence of stigma uh, playing out in terms of how services are delivered and structured uh, and perpetuating this idea that only certain people can talk about STBBIs uh, really does perpetuate stigma. Also, people often experience, um, you know, they may avoid help, they may experience shame, uh, fear, mistrust, uh, guilt, and uh, certainly experiences of trauma, 
uh, and other uh, sort of negative or adverse experiences do uh, impact how people experience stigma and how it impacts their health seeking behavior or help seeking behavior. So here are a few examples of what stigma can look like in practice. And some of these are things that people often just don't even realize are problematic in any way. Um, so one is often when we're talking about funding or program or service delivery, um, there are priority populations identified or we're asked to say, who are we, who's our target population? Who's our priority population? And this is often based on, um, you know, uh, epidemiological data. So who has STBIBIs, therefore who is at risk and who needs the service? What this can do though, um, as a sort of a unintended consequence perhaps, is when we identify priority populations, we may be reinforcing the message that unless you're in one of those populations, you don't need to worry about this, you're fine. Um, and that can impact people's self-assessment of risk, their decision-making about um, taking precautions, uh, about trusting partners, uh, all sorts of things. So it can skew their sense of risk. It can also impact healthcare providers and organizations in terms of a sense of whether this is relevant or important um, or impacting a significant number of people they serve. Uh, so one example is that I often have heard that, oh, well, of course, we would have those types of services available in our centers that work with youth. But um, if I'm in a community that is primarily, um, you know, in our health center, we see seniors more than we see young people, uh, then we don't need to talk about STDBIs because we deal with seniors. So seniors don't like have sex or use substances or do any of those things. So we don't need to worry about it. That is a really classic example of stigma um, showing up in terms of how people understand the population they serve. Um, even reinforcing ideas about gender, gender identity, gender expression, um, asking people, are you male or female? With no opportunity, um, no acknowledgement that uh, there are people who identify as neither, there are other gender identities, and there are some folks who do not have a gender identity, uh, do not ascribe to uh, a model where they must choose an identity. And so how in just the way our services are structured and delivered, are we communicating um, our values and beliefs, our assumptions about the people we serve? And so when we ask questions, whether it's on a survey or um, maybe at an intake or screening, uh, when we're asking people questions in this either or or binary way, um, we are essentially reinforcing stigma. And that may not be our intent, but that's certainly often the impact. Um, acknowledging, you know, if someone asks about STBBI testing or treatment, um, and we may feel we're reassuring someone by saying, you know, oh, I don't think people in your situation need to worry about that. I've had that experience myself. Um, so I identify as queer um, and my primary partner is female. And I, many, many years ago, almost 30 years ago, um, had asked a family physician that I was seeing at the time uh, about um, sexually transmitted infections. And I was told, oh, you're so lucky. People in your situation don't need to worry about those things. As in women who are in sexual relationships with women don't need to worry about STBBIs because evidently none of that happens there. Um, and I thankfully knew better and was able to say, actually, that's not true. And I'm asking you for a specific reason. Uh, but I actually had to not only educate that healthcare provider, but in some ways argue and self advocate. Uh, and thankfully, I was able to do that. And certainly the privilege that I hold as a a white woman, as a, somebody who's educated, who's worked in the sector, um, and who you know, is comfortable communicating in English, all of these things um, add to my ability to self-advocate and educate. Uh, if I was met with that all the time, or if um, I didn't have those privileges, uh, it may be, oh, okay, I, I guess you're the doctor, you're right. Um, thanks, I don't need to worry about it, good to go. Um, also, if somebody is tested for STBBIs 
and they're positive, particularly for some of the um, infections that aren't curable. Uh, it may um, be overwhelming for healthcare providers to deliver that news. Perhaps they've never had to say this type of thing to someone before, or our own thoughts about, oh, how would I feel if someone were telling me this, that I am HIV positive, for example. Um, so prefacing that with things like, this is the worst news I've ever had to give someone, um, reinforces the stigma that this is, um, you know, kind of the end of, of your life right now. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm giving you catastrophic news. Uh, when it, rather than talking about um, all of the information, the, the, the hopeful things, the challenging things, and presenting it just as we would present other types of health conditions. The other things we often see, of course, are that harm reduction tools like condoms, um, access to uh, drug using equipment, uh, whether that's injection, inhalation, et cetera, um, is uh, available in the core neighborhoods, but not in suburban neighborhoods. Is, is another example. So there's a, a statement in that, that these are issues that don't affect people in our neighborhood. Uh, so if you're one of the people who's impacted by it and would benefit from that, um, you may be essentially hearing non-verbally uh, through these uh, availability or lack of availability of services and, and uh, you know, tools to help us stay well or as well as we can, um, that you're the only one here that this affects. You're strange, you're unusual. And that certainly is often not the intention. And these decisions are often driven not by need, but by resource availability. However, that doesn't change the fact that uh, they reinforce stigma. So when we look at stigma, um, we know we have seen significant advances in prevention, testing, and treatment uh, where people can access um, sometimes uh, testing much more quickly uh, than in previous, um, in, and uh, treatment has advanced so phenomenally uh, in a lot of cases. So we look at things like hepatitis C. Uh, when I was doing this work, you know, over a decade ago, it was a, a chronic condition that often was life limiting in that it shortened people's life expectancy. Now, it's uh, curable in many cases. And so that has changed uh, the way we understand uh, some of these conditions. However, um, stigma hasn't necessarily shifted with those things. And so um, we still see studies that show us and people's lived experience that tells us that health and social service settings are often full of stigma for people who are impacted by STBDIs. The other thing I really want to mention is that very often our attempts at prevention uh, rely on fear and risk-based messaging. Uh, so that can, you know, be a, a well-intentioned, I think, attempt at, um, you know, warning people about what they might be getting into. The reality is, though, regardless of intent, the impact of that is often to really seriously reinforce stigma and significantly impact people's help seeking and health seeking behaviors, typically in a negative way. Um, so we do know uh, that fear and risk based messaging doesn't work and in fact can cause harm, uh, particularly for folks in non dominant social groups. And so we need to be so, so mindful of our messaging, whether we're designing a public campaign or teaching about sexual uh, reproductive health or uh, working one-on-one -on -one with someone and helping them navigate their own um, risks and decision-making in their life. So when we look at where stigma comes from, of course, there's lots of contributing factors, including um, colonization uh, and shifts in, in worldview, uh, essentially, um, you know, in inserting a new value set and enforcing that upon others. The legal status of drugs has certainly uh, been an impact on uh, influencing factor for stigma. Uh, fear of infection uh, and some of the language used around talking about uh, STBVIs has often uh, fed into stigma. Social structures that feed things like classism, racism, sexism, heterosexism, 
ableism and so on, um, and perceived association with these stigmatized identities and activities like, um, you know, who is it that uses injection drugs? Um, and there's often a picture in our mind. That is a picture that is informed by stigma. And so uh, challenging ourselves if we're service providers to confront our own stigma. We may think we're very open-minded, we're very non-judgmental, and many of us in intent, we are. Uh, but we may also be impacted. In fact, we are impacted by the world we, in which we live, and it uh, does impact uh, our uh, beliefs, our assumptions, our stereotypes. And a lot of that is implicit. It's not necessarily something we have conscious awareness of unless we take the time to actually tune into it. So we may be enacting stigma uh, without being aware of it. So one of the most important things for all of us to do is to be aware that even when we consider ourselves to be non-judgmental and open-minded, um, that we may still be enacting stigma and to do the work to become self-aware, self-reflexive and so on uh, to challenge that uh, stigma. A big part of stigma um, and the way it's enacted is through language. And so sometimes, uh, again, it's not about our intent, it's about the impact of this. And so the language we use around uh, communicating about testing, screening, uh, reporting, monitoring, and so on, reinforce uh, st reinforces stigma. Uh, it's typically not intended to blame uh, people for uh, having STBBIs or uh, say, well, it was totally your fault that this happened, um, or well, it's your fault that that treatment didn't work or um, you didn't adhere to it. But we use language that conveys those messages uh, anyway, and people hear that. And so even when we talk about, I work with a lot of epidemiologists and we talk about um, STBBI surveillance a lot. Well, surveillance to the broader population outside of the world of epidemiology and public health um, actually is about being watched, right? And um, sometimes, or typically, without your knowledge. That's not a very nice thing to think about um, and to feel. And so it's really important that we be mindful of it. Similarly, when we're talking about substance use and we use language like, um, you know, make sure you use a clean needle or how long have you been clean? The opposite of that phrasing is dirty. And so we may not intend to imply that if somebody is reusing supplies or continues to use a substance that they're dirty, uh, but that may be how they feel. And that's really what stigma is about. Uh, so being very, very mindful of how we use language um, and what that might be conveying, even if that's not the intent. Uh, so how can we shift language or be very mindful of context uh, and how language can be perceived and experienced by folks? So how does stigma affect folks that we're trying to support? Um, it can mean people are less able to access the tools they need to stay as well as possible, things like condoms, needle exchange programs, and so on. Uh, because uh, stigma is attached to accessing those types of services. And so a great example um, is that until uh, very recently, actually Prairie Harm Reductions moved to its current space, uh, that organization worked in a, in a space that essentially uh, didn't have any visible exterior signage. And people are often like, it's really hard to find you know, this office or this service. What, why don't you put a big sign out front? Stigma, right? Stigma, that is why. Um, and, and there are still services. And of course, one of the ways to counteract that is to have the great big sign. The trade-off may be that people don't feel comfortable walking into the building with the big sign that says sexual health or harm reduction or um, needle exchange on it. And so it is so, so important that we're always balancing that, right? Is how are we challenging and confronting stigma through visibility, through um, making things uh, more open, normalizing some of these types of services um, and, and really opening the door to the conversation by, by being visible and um, also 
balancing that with the reality that for some people that visibility actually becomes part of the barrier. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, stigma is well documented as a barrier to testing. Uh, people are fearful of how others might view them, how they'll be treated by healthcare providers, uh, whether their test results are going to be um, protected and private. And especially when people have had um, an individual and or collective history of not trusting healthcare providers, Indigenous people in particular, um, that co is compounded um, exponentially and may create uh, such a significant barrier to testing that we have to go to extraordinary lengths to overcome those barriers. Uh, fear of extreme ex discrimination, so that overt enacted stigma, uh, can mean people who have symptoms delay seeking help. Uh, people may be Googling uh, their symptoms, trying to self-diagnose to avoid having to uh, access uh, healthcare providers or other types of support. Um, and that may mean that it's more likely uh, by the time they seek care, uh, they've had some adverse health effects, sometimes long-term, lifelong in some cases, or transmit uh, if they have an infection to others. Uh, we also can see uh, stigma impact people's ability to stick to their treatment. Uh, it may be people don't, they don't want someone to ask, well, why are you taking that antibiotic? Did, what, what's going on? Um, and they don't want to have to answer those questions. So they don't know how. Um, and so they're afraid if they say, well, uh, because I have chlamydia, uh, that the, they'll be treated differently, judged, um, shamed and so on. And so uh, this becomes a, a challenge as well. Um, the, I used to work with lots of folks who um, were quite worried about um, people seeing their medications and they would go to great lengths to hide what they were taking, uh, particularly when they were on medications that really the only use for them was to treat things like HIV or hepatitis, uh, that it wouldn't take long, especially in today's uh, sort of information age to find out um, why one would take those medications. Uh, so certainly there are some challenges that are unique uh, to some uh, STBBIs, but it certainly shows up across the board. So this is a model that was designed to help us understand how stigma impacts people around tuberculosis. Uh, a lot of the learning around stigma um, is sort of co-created and uh, comes out of uh, a variety of conditions. STBBIs, tuberculosis uh, has a lot of similarities. There's some differences, but this model has been very helpful in some of the work I've done with TB programs and uh, service providers around TB stigma. And really it is actually based off of um, learning from HIV and other STBBIs. And so it looks at how stigma distorts the way healthcare providers function um, the way individuals are impacted and the way the community and society is impacted. Uh, so it's been a helpful uh, way of understanding this. So one thing that's interesting is stigma can uh, distort or skew our infection control practices. So those precautionary me measures that we take. So, I mean, the picture I've chosen for this slide is somewhat um, designed to be humorous that, you know, we're putting on full hazmat suits and hosing off. But um, sometimes people's fear uh, and the amount of misinformation out there or lack of information out there results in some fairly extreme behaviors, including in healthcare providers. Um, people may use excessive precautions around certain individuals or groups, or the flip side of that is use inadequate precautions around others. And of course, healthcare providers should be using universal precautions if they're in contact with blood and body fluids um, for everyone they're in contact with. Uh, even if it's not, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be in contact with that. There are standards and protocols put in place for a reason. However, um, it does happen where people uh, decide those standard precautions are inadequate. And because I know this person has uh, a particular health issue, an STBBI, I'm going to over, uh, so become over precautious. And uh, we've seen this when people have been hospitalized, uh, 
where um, the precautions are increased for the safety of the person hospitalized, especially if there's something like HIV where it impacts their immune system. Uh, but it's often experienced by that person because of stigma that those increased infection control practices are actually um, driven by fear. People are afraid of the person and afraid of getting what they've got. Uh, and often we don't do a good job of communicating consistently and clearly and compassionately with people that actually these enhanced infection control uh, precautions are because you are vulnerable and we do not want to make you ill. Uh, and so that person might be left to uh, feel that people are afraid of them, afraid of getting what they have, even though it can't be transmitted through the air. Um, we also though see uh, sometimes visible precautions that in increase stigma where um, even recently I've uh, heard stories of people not wanting to deliver a tray of food into the room of someone who is known to have HIV. Why does someone who's delivering food to a room in a hospital or healthcare center know that person has HIV? That's often about stigma. Why would we share that information when we don't share other personal health information? Because we think that person needs to know to keep themselves safe, um, should take additional precautions and so on. We also see though that people with sexually transmitted bloodborne uh, infections or illnesses may self-isolate or avoid interactions with others, be afraid to tell others about their diagnoses or avoid um, clinics, services associated with SPBBIs because of that fear, right? How am I gonna be treated? Are people going to put a glove, a gown, a mask? Well, right now it's a little different and in fact might actually help uh, with some of this uh, aspect of stigma because it's becoming so common uh, to wear that uh, PPE. However, people may still um, not want to be around children, for example, even if they've been assured that no, you are not a risk uh, to your kids. Uh, they may still have that internalized stigma that tells them, no, I shouldn't be around them. Uh, and, and there may often be a lot of shame and guilt associated with that. Uh, people may be reluctant to uh, be, have any physical contact with a partner, for example, even if they know um, that there are only certain activities that create a risk for transmitting uh, STBBI, or they may be hesitant to disclose that or other risk factors. We also know that stigma increases stress. And so stress can contribute to how well our immune systems function, which can contribute to the progression of some STBBIs and the development or progression of other physical and mental health conditions. And so that can also impact our social well being, our relational well being, um, and our relationships with healthcare providers. And so um, we may not cope well with stress, which means perhaps um, we're quick to anger or um, really struggling to communicate what's happening to us. Uh, and so we may not get the care we need from healthcare providers or the support that we need from family, friends, colleagues, and others in our lives. We also know, of course, that stigma impacts testing and health seeking. So sometimes, uh, the way we approach testing is experienced as aggressive or targeted screening or testing uh, and people feel labeled or stereotyped as a member of an at-risk group um, and and often the perception or the reality is there's limited or no screening or testing of people outside those perceived groups um, so that certainly can create uh, challenges and reinforce stigma. Uh, fear of being targeted for texting or negative experiences with testing can also um, have a long-term impact on health-seeking behavior. So um, in communities where there's maybe high prevalence, so high rates of STBBIs, uh, people can be afraid to present at testing sites or even go to the local clinic uh, for fear that they'll be targeted for testing and then um, feel pressured to be tested perhaps. So there's a, a wide range of impacts on testing and screening. And ultimately in terms of healthcare providers, a stigma undermines our relationships with the folks we're here to support. People may not trust us. They may not wanna tell us 
all the information about their, the risks in their life or the behaviors they're engaging in. So one example uh, is around substance use. People may be very, very hesitant to be open about uh, the nature of substance use. And providers are often hesitant to ask. And so they may ask about things like cannabis use, partly because the legal status of cannabis has opened the door to that conversation a bit. Um, but they often assume that unless you fit a particular group that is um, very obvious or um, you've clearly identified yourself with that group, that you don't need to talk about that. So again, even in my own experience, um, I have had experiences where um, I have chronic pain. I've been prescribed opioids. I actually had a significant dependence on opioids for quite some time. Um, because I am a university educated white woman, I was never ever screened or talked to about risk of dependency, uh, mental health, or um, any type of harm reduction or questioning around are, are you taking your pills orally still or ha are you doing other things? Um, there was never any questioning. I was basically allowed to carry on unchecked um, and it was only by chance. Um, and I would say partly by privilege that I um, managed to uh, turn that around and not end up in a more um, difficult position uh, and with more health challenges than I already had. And so that is, that's stigma in action. Um, I also though, uh, even though I'm very informed and understand this, was very hesitant to disclose to my healthcare providers that I thought I might have a problem with dependency and maybe misusing my opioids. They didn't ask, so I didn't tell. Uh, that's stigma in action. Uh, people can be re-traumatized or experience trauma for the first time, uh, but certainly folks who already have a trauma history are more vulnerable potentially to being re-traumatized in healthcare settings. And so if people feel that they're being blamed, judged, labeled, uh, it's more likely that they're going to uh, experience another uh, trauma, which then, of course, means that uh, healthcare might not be seen as safe or is even less safe than it was before. Uh, and folks may not uh, be able to complete their treatments. And uh, this can impact people's recovery, their sense of self. Uh, this impacts the way we record and report STBBIs because people feel um, hesitant or people aren't being uh, screened for those conditions. Uh, it can contribute to a range of other health issues, increase the likelihood of poor treatment adherence and outcomes, and reduce testing rates and increased uh, stigma. So um, what we can do, uh, the Canadian Public Health Association has done some phenomenal work around STBBI stigma. And um, this is very much how they're framing this, that harm reduction rather than um, just don't do those things, or we need to get you to a place where you're stopping that, um, is certainly a critical piece of addressing stigma, um, which uh, harm reduction really is about accepting that people do things that have risk attached to them, all sorts of things, not just sexual and substance use things. Um, and uh, so we need to get comfortable with harm reduction. Sex positivity, so being open and um, talking about sex, not just in terms of risk and illness and disease prevention, uh, but talking about sex in terms of pleasure, uh, in terms of uh, the complexities of relationships, talking about consent and so on. And that we also need to become trauma and violence informed, which means understanding that a very large number of folks we see in our work have trauma histories, and lots of us who do the work have trauma histories, and all of that contributes to uh, how people interact with um, information, with healthcare providers, with their communities, with their partners, with themselves, and so on. So um, we don't have time to get into a lot of uh, the practice piece, but happily, there's going to be future webinars that will uh, go into some of the tools available 
But a few things just to think about. I've already mentioned clarifying your values, doing some of that reflection on your experience of stigma. Um, using correct terminology is so, so critical. Um, and making sure that uh, the, the use of terminology is as consistent as possible. Using inclusive language and images uh, that reflect a broad range of folks. Being aware of your body language when you talk about uh, sex, drugs, and so on. Um, for me, I realized early on, whenever I talked about sex, I would uh, basically turn red as a beat. Uh, I grew up not ever talking about sex. So it was something that even though I had done a lot of work to get comfortable, my body was still not comfortable talking about it. And it betrayed my, my uh, attempt at looking comfortable. So what would I do? I'd acknowledge it. It's like, yeah, see, I'm even getting a little bit weird about this. But this is a thing we all need to talk about because it's part of all of our lives. Uh, and that was actually a really helpful relationship building technique was acknowledging my own discomfort, which opened the door for people to talk about their level of comfort. Uh, recognize layers of stigma, uh, practice answering tough questions, uh, consider your professional obligations. Do you have a code of ethics or code of conduct or a statement of values? How does this all fit within that? And how can we create inclusive and affirming spaces uh, that people see themselves there um, and they get that you won't look at them and say, no, this isn't for you or you don't need to worry about it or I'm going to target you because of how I perceive you to be. So, uh, some reflective questions uh, to take away. What are some common assumptions you may have about people who access services? How might that impact your engagement? And what's the impact of assumptions on how your services are designed and delivered? Um, so just be mindful of avoiding assumptions. Uh, CPHA has really great resources on this. Um, so assuming everyone's heterosexual or cisgender, everyone's embarrassed to talk about sex. Maybe they're not at all embarrassed and we're embarrassed. Um, assuming everyone's sexually active or not sexually active. Uh, everyone has the same worldview about sex and, su and substance use, sexuality, sexual identity. Everybody has the same level of knowledge and understanding about these things, that all sexual activity is consensual and all substance use is consensual. So, um, if you need something to kind of latch on to, this could be your question. What can I do um, in the next week, a uh, few days even? This can be overwhelming and it's lifelong work. So I find it helpful to break it down and make it tangible. So what can you do uh, to reduce STBBI stigma in your own uh, part of the world? And uh, some of what you could do is check out some of the great resources, including CPHA's uh, STBBI and Related Stigma Project. Um, it is a, a really wonderful uh, resource, has some toolkits and some discussion guides, uh, as well as assessment tools and so on. So I encourage you to take a look at some of the resources in the slide deck. You can also reach out to me if you have questions, would like a, a recommendation for a resource, um, or even a consult on how to respond to a particular situation. So um, let's talk. Do you have questions, um, comments, other things you would like to uh, hear about uh, in the future, perhaps, as well? Um, there's a question for, from Brianna in the chat. She says that this hour was an inclusive and insightful blip to the barriers faced within our healthcare system. Is this kind of training required by those who are currently working in the field, i.e. hospitals, clinics, et cetera? Sadly, no. <laughs> um, in some settings, yes. Uh, but within the health authority, not uh, a widespread requirement. It does happen on occasion. Uh, so I've done training with folks who work in sexual health clinics, in some of the street outreach, uh, as well as folks who, who work in, say, the, the tuber tuberculosis program. Uh, but it's not a standardized requirement. And as far as I know, learning about stigma and, and the impact of stigma isn't a requirement in uh, health science programs in terms of training. So we have work to do. We absolutely do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Um, I, I have a question for you. Um, why do you perceive that there's often perhaps reluctance um, for care providers to address stigma in their practice or mitigate it? And um, what needs to happen to reduce that reluctance? I think sometimes people don't have an accurate like sense of self-awareness about it being an issue for them. Um, and I think sometimes people overestimate their comfort or underestimate their discomfort with things. And uh, often there's a sense, I think, that if this is important to someone, they'll bring it up and then I'll deal with it. And because no one's brought it up, therefore it's not a significant issue in my practice. And I have a million other things that I need to stay on top of um, that are, are really critical information. And so, like I had one physician say, yeah, I get this, it's important. And I have like dozens of patients who have diabetes. I have zero patients who've come to me and talk about STBDIs. And I was like, that's because those things are highly stigmatized and people <laughs> might not feel comfortable talking to you. They might be accessing other supports that are maybe better for them, maybe less convenient for them, or, or they would rather be talking to you. So um, I think one of the biggest errors we make is assuming because we don't see it, that's our evidence, our proof that we don't need to do any work around stigma. <laughs> and so uh, it's this vicious cycle of, uh, yeah, it doesn't come up in our clinic. So I think we're good. And it's like, is the reason it doesn't come up in your clinic? Because maybe you're not. Uh, so it's a strange thing to navigate for folks, I think, sometimes. And because it's, it's often not identified as a priority in terms of training um, or orientation, then it doesn't send a message that this is really critical and important for all of us to be exploring and learning about. Yeah, that's, that actually leads into my next question. Um, so for people who would like to advocate for this training, um, but perhaps work in places or with colleagues who don't see it as a priority, what, what might you recommend um, they take in terms of advocating for this kind of training or mm. getting it to be a priority? Well, I think one of the pieces that can be useful as, as much as it's a bit of a strange thing is that like we are in a crisis in Saskatchewan when it comes to STBBIs. Like we got a problem on our hands. Um, Therefore, it should be all of our responsibility to do whatever we can in terms of training. Uh, and so I think the, the rates uh, it can be useful in that way and that we can say, look, clearly everyone's got some work to do and it can't hurt us to learn about this, right? There's really no downside. Um, and it, there's a massive potential for an upside if we can actually do this learning together. Uh, and I think it's also um, the other way I've suggested folks frame it is, well, it can help us see what we're doing really well. And so sometimes it's an opportunity to be like, yeah, we already do that. That's awesome. We're great. Um, but also to identify where we want to put our time, our energy, our resources in terms of focus. And so it can help in terms of resource allocation. And sometimes that's the language that, especially in larger systems, people need to hear is, well, this is about like responsible use of our resources. So we need to know how are we doing? And maybe we're doing better than we thought, maybe we're not, um, but we don't know unless we dive into the topic. Um, so in some cases that can help too. Awesome. So in an upstream sense, what do you think we could change socially um, or even academically in order to make this less of an issue in the long run? Hmm. Well, I do think um, the three sort of pillars of CPHA's approach are really critical across the board, whether that's in education settings or in practice settings or just in our community in general, is how do we create a world where we can um, validate and normalize um, harm reduction as, I mean, we all engage in harm reduction practices. We often don't use the language unless we're talking about substance use or sex. Um, and so being able to sort of talk about like, yeah, seatbelts, harm reduction, hey, that's really cool. Or love your life jacket, that's that life jacket, that's nice harm reduction for you. And, <laughs> and I started doing it kind of as a bit of a like, 
um, snarky commentary on, on the critique of harm reduction, but I found it actually is really helpful because people go, oh, what? And it's like, yeah, like, I don't want to drown either. So I'm going to throw a life jacket on. We're, we're all doing it, right? We look both ways before we cross the street. We do all these things. But I think we've, um, the stigma has really meant we sort of have this little pocket um, where we don't, we see it as so different and separate and apart from everyday life. And it really isn't. Um, I think the other thing is even um, broadening our understanding of trauma and how it impacts people broadening our understanding of sex, sexuality, and challenging ourselves around um, sex positivity, especially those of us who are like involved with kids, we're parents, we're aunties, we're teachers, we're, you know, um, whatever. How are we responding when questions come? How are we reacting when situations come up? Um, are we perpetuating shame and guilt and a sense that this is not okay to talk about? And are we promoting messages around consent um, and uh, you know, bodily autonomy and all the stuff that comes with it? And I think all of those pieces are so critical to shifting uh, the overall culture around sex and substance use that is really going to start eating away at the stigma attached to those things. That's really great and insightful. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, there's a question from Tina in the chat. She says, hi, Erin, will you be doing any FNMI populations webinars on this topic? Uh, nothing planned at the moment, but uh, if anybody's got connections and wants to set that up, uh, you now have my email address and know how to find me. Um, I, absolutely. The other thing I really want to say is the uh, Canadian Public Health Association's project on this has um, a toolkit, but also has a set of like slide decks, facilitation guides. So people can take this and use it in their own context without the need to bring in somebody who's an expert like me. Um, anyone can have a conversation about stigma and CPHA is there with the support and the resources to help that happen without the need to find time, resources, whatever's needed or to bring in someone to present on it. And I think so often um, there's a sense that, oh, well, you know, you come from down the road and you carry a briefcase, so you're an expert and we'll listen to you. But really the capacity I fully believe is within each of our communities and organizations to, to respond and, and do this work ourselves. And so CPHA has brilliantly, I think, uh, laid out a map for how that could happen and is available to help folks adapt that to their local context, so. That's the other recommendation I have for that. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, is there anything you'd like to share before we start wrapping things up? I don't think so. I really appreciate everyone taking a bit of time out of their very busy schedules to uh, tune in this morning. And I hope you, um, if you have colleagues or um, others in your communities or organizations who would benefit from this, um, share resource lists, slide decks, whatever you need um to get this message out there because certainly often the folks who show up in these events are you know sort of like preaching to the choir and uh people who've already been thinking about stigma and, and and engaging in some of their own learning and unlearning so how do we get people who need to be in these uh in these sessions uh engaged that's always the big question so spread the word and don't feel like you're not um, an expert enough to be the one who raises this topic or speaks out on it. I think we all can. I think that's really great advice. These conversations are absolutely necessary and this presentation has been so informative. So thank you so much, Erin, for sharing your knowledge today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Um, I'm just going to share a quick photo here so I can share some information. Um, once you close this webinar window, you will be taken to a, an evaluation survey link. If you want to give a quick click on that, you will be able to review this webinar, give us some feedback, help us plan our future sessions. Our next webinar will be next, or not next Thursday, but November 19th, so two weeks from now, and it will be on rural HIV prevention and care with Dr. Stuart Skinner from 10 a.m. until 11 a.m.
Um, we also at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute moderate a Google group called the Adolescent Sexual Health Community of Practice. If you're interested in being a part of that group, please send me an email at sholt at skprevention.ca. And if you're interested in accessing free resources um, on sexual and reproductive health from the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute, please visit our website, check it out. There's a lot of different things on there um, and they are free. So you can access those however you like. And if you need help with shipping, just let me know. Thank you so much again, Erin. And thank you everyone for spending your Thursday morning with us. Um, have a wonderful day.